So to make sure we got the sound and everything. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Hear you and see you in your full motion. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I'll get started then. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank the North Shore Radar Club for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. You know, obviously, I don't have the experience that, that some of the others do in Earth Moon Earth communications, but I can bring maybe a different element to it uh, in terms of analysis, the physics, the engineering, and they're really the experts in the operation. Um, the other point I want to make is this is a QRP EME. It just barely operates. And we'll get into that as we go through the talk. So the objective was to describe QRP EME. And in fact, I wanted to do it originally before the 50th anniversary of the moon landing occurred in, in 2019, and I achieved that. And I'll, I'll go on with the story, but specifically, we're gonna talk about the physics, the lunar characteristics, ionospheric propagation, antenna gain, and then the engineering, which includes the um, station description and some details on JC, JC, sorry, JT65B signaling and performance. And then I'll talk about operations, the QSO measurements, model performance, QSLs, and then the summary, we'll, we'll talk about what the limitations are. And it's, it's kind of interesting if you think about it for a while. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the EME Elmers and uh, starting with Dennis Hall when we first started discussing this in 2018 and Ed Bicknell, uh, they're both uh, colleagues from Lincoln Laboratory. And then I got on the air without really knowing very much. And the first contact I made was a terrestrial QSO using JT65B. I didn't know that there was a protocol for when to transmit and when to receive. And I heard Bill Corbin's signal and I thought, wow, this is the first moon contact. Bill, as he mentioned, has got a station in Florida as well as in Rhode Island. This was the Rhode Island link. It's about maybe 40, 50 miles away, if that. And uh, But that led to a, a lunch with uh, W3CGK and uh, November 1, November Kilo, Jim Spears. Uh, they're two guys that both operate EME in Rhode Island. So we got together, and, and after about three hours, they described to me, all the details that I needed to know to get on the air. You know, things like um, the call three text and so on. We'll go into that in a little more detail. And then finally, in January, uh, Dr. Marsha Williams, uh, Kilo 5 Queen, uh, Quebec Echo, is he's got a, a huge station and he's always trying to promote uh, EME. He, his station would be relatively easy for me to hear if there weren't for some of the geometric uh, limitations I have that I'll describe further on. <clears throat> so this project in 2019, 2018, I named it Project Selene after the Greek goddess of the moon, Selene, which is interesting because Artemis now is the, uh, the name of the US effort to land men on the moon again after 53 years. So um, I use that just as to make it interesting. All right, this is to show you exactly what I mean by EME. It's sending a signal, in my case, from Connecticut up to the moon and then back to the Earth, to any station potentially that has a view of the moon. And there are certain geometry constraints, as we'll go into in detail, both for me and for the other operator. For example, if, if I can talk to Europe, then it's not likely that I'd be able to talk to somebody in Japan just because of the, the position the Earth is with respect to um, the moon. Uh, the work that I did was at 144 megahertz, two meters. And I chose that because the equipment I had, and it wouldn't have been as expensive if I had gone to say the microwave region. And I think there are a lot of people operating at two meters now too, maybe most people. <clears throat> okay, so defining QRP EME. So in amateur radio, QRP operation means low power generally. But in this case, I've extended that to include the equivalent isotropic radiated power, which is the product of the uh, transmit power and your antenna gain. So if you had a transmitter that was 100 watts, that's 20 dBW, and an antenna that had, say, 20 dB of gain, isotropic gain, then you would add those two logarithms, 10 times the logarithm of those two numbers, and you would get a 40 dBWI 
EIRP. That's the equivalent of a 10,000 watt transmitter radiating into a sphere, you know, all directions. The antenna, and I hate to use this word, tends to focus the beam or direct it in a specific direction. And that's why the equivalent isotropic radiated power sounds so large, 10,000 watts versus 100 watts. It's because the power has been directed into a narrow beam roughly on the order of 30 to 40 degrees for the uh, low power or QRP EME. So I'm gonna talk about what you need to do to demonstrate low power EME at two they meters. You may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. So that's well said, President Kennedy. QRP VHF EME is possible, but it's very difficult. We're really operating in a regime where you're dominated by noise. And that's beyond what Shannon talks about in the Shannon theorem, where you try to get a, a combined power aperture product that's going to allow you to have noiseless communication. We're going to be operating in a regime where the probability of communicating is less than 100%. Shannon talked about 100% error free. And he said, you need this much energy per bit. We're going below that and we're suffering a loss. But this is what ham radio operators do all the time if they're operating QRP. The signal isn't always there. It's very difficult. That makes it interesting. And then finally, uh, QRO VHF EME is expensive. You need larger antennas. You need transmitters a kilowatt or more, maybe an array of antennas. You may need um, adaptive polarization. You'll need a rotor. All of these things are expensive. I've done this without any of that to show that it could be done. And then finally, it's fun. So to start off with the physics, we'll talk about the key lunar characteristics. The range is about roughly a quarter of a million miles, one way. So we have a two-way path that approaches a half a million miles. So that's, that's DX, that's for sure. You have to look at the lunar diameter. So it's about 2,000 miles. If you look at the ratio of the diameter to the range, you get an angle. That angle is about a half a degree. So I have a beam width in my, my system that's about 38 degrees wide. So it's not critical to point it. You have to be able to point it in the general direction of the moon. You don't need a rotor, which is one of the reductions in the cost. You can point it by hand. The first time I used, I did this successfully, I used a compass and a, an inclinometer and it was cloudy. So I knew where the moon was, but I couldn't see it. So I pointed the antenna in the general direction. It turns out you'll see that it would have been better if I had left it horizontal on the correct azimuth. Okay, so a lot of people view this as, it is a communication problem, but because I have a radar background, I see it better suited to an analysis using radar techniques, understanding the moon as a radar target with a radar cross-section. So to get an estimate of the radar cross-section, you look at the, the cross-sectional area. Again, that's why you need the diameter of the moon. You calculate the cross-sectional area. And then you need the reflectivity, how much of your energy is reflected back from the moon. So an approximation for a sphere that's a, that has a less than 100% reflectivity would be the product of the reflectivity times the area. Converting that to decibels, we take 10 times the log of that number, and you get 118.45 dBSM. That's decibels related to a square meter. So a typical airplane might have uh, one square meter to 10 square meters. So zero dBSM to maybe 10 dBSM. In this case, is 118 dBSM. The next thing you look at if, if you're a radar guy is look at what the distribution of the signal is. In other words, the signal fades. And the typical communication, communications guy looks at uh, Rayleigh uh, fading. 
Well, in this case, that may not be quite right, as you'll see in a, in a coming chart. And then you look at the polarization. For linear polarization, the polarization that's returned by the moon is stays the same. Whatever goes in pretty much comes out, mainly comes out. There's some uh, scattering into other polarizations, orthogonal polarizations, but it's primarily in, in vertical, out vertical. If you were to transmit circular polarization, the rule for circular polarization, right hand in, left hand back. So it rotates, the it changes the sense of polarization if you use circular polarization. I mentioned also that there's fading associated with this, and it's relatively slow fading, several seconds, but the message takes 45 or so seconds to transmit. So there will be fades during the time of transmission. So looking at the uh, cross-section, it's been measured. It was measured back in 1963. You can see here's a plot that shows the cumulative, cumulative distribution, uh, probability distribution, and you can see the median RCS is a roughly 118 dBSM. So this is the number that I will use in the radar expression to calculate the received power by my system. Okay, then I mentioned that the, there's a fading. Uh, there are a number of mathematical descriptions in radar that you would use to describe what a radar target does. And it's caused by reflections. If you take, for example, an object, maybe an airplane, you get a reflection from the nose, you get a reflection from the vertical stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer, the wings. These can interfere if the distances between those are, are, are large or comparable to a wavelength. So in the case of the moon, you have the surface of the moon and you'll get a reflection from the lunar mare, which are the smoother areas that look uh, to, to people in the Middle Ages like seas, and then from craters and mountains. So there's going to be a, a, a distribution, a fading that's associated. The best example I can use to explain that is a laser. If you look at a laser reflecting off of a wall or a chart uh, in a presentation, you'll see a speckle pattern. That speckle pattern is Rayleigh distributed, meaning that you see these, these little interference patterns, little little speckles, little uh, spots that are that will change if you move your head. Those are that's caused by interference from the surface of the wall, say for example, and then that com it's combined in your eye and you get constructive and destructive interference. But the key for Rayleigh distribution, a Rayleigh distribution is roughly equal scatterers. A Ricean distribution is more common in radar. It's one major scatterer, say the lunar mare, and then a lot of other scatterers, areas that are rough compared to a wavelength, in this case, larger than a couple meters. So you get something that's that's better from a radar point of view than a Rayleigh distribution, but it's called a Ricean distribution. So what does that mean? Okay, if you were, let me get a laser pointer going here. If you were to take and put a threshold here at say seven and a half normalized amplitude, you would say anything on this side, you would integrate this curve. Anything on this side is cons considered a bit of information or radar detection. Anything on this side would be missed. This distribution has a fatter tail and, a, and the distribution is shifted to the right. So it's easier to see a target that has a rising distribution. So the moon is more like this. This is a measurement that was done at um, 425 megahertz, again in 1963. So another component is, I mentioned earlier, the, the reflection from the moon. Okay, there's a characteristic called specular reflection. That means like a reflection from a mirror. It preserves the polarization if it's linear. So here they made a measurement with a pulsed radar and it swept across the surface of the moon. Imagine this getting rings, you know, looking at the center and then getting rings around the moon from the, the, the delayed pulse return from those portions. So the smooth part produces a, a nice reflection that preserves the linear polarization. And the other portions are representative of craters and mountains. And they scatter the, the polarization, they randomize it. So that's energy that's gonna be lost from your return. And that's part of the 7% that's being talked about in a single polarization, reflectivity of 7% roughly. And here you can see the reflection coefficient is a function of wavelength. 
Here we are at two meters. This is um, 70 centimeters here. And you can see that here's the line for about 7.4%. So it's roughly, to first order, it's constant. It doesn't change a lot, maybe a factor of two, something like that, <clears throat> 3 dB. All right, now we're gonna talk, so now we've characterized the moon as a radar target. We've mentioned what its cross-section is, what the statistics are, whether it preserves polarization or not. And now we're gonna talk about what happens to your polarization. Well, the first thing that happens is that, well, the moon is, is, is moving through the sky and this is where the moon was on the first night that I succeeded in doing a, an EME. The azimuth was here and I, I was interested in working the moon just as it had risen. And the reason for that will be described later because you get additional gain in your antenna and you'll see that. So this is the regime, but you can see the moon is moving. And this is what the moon did from Connecticut. At, at the DX station, the moon was in a different position of the sky. That first DX um, measurement or, or QSO was with a Russian station, so it was very different. Okay, so what happens to the polarization? Okay, well, if I transmit vertical polarization, the Russian station is going to see that it's been rotated by roughly 60 degrees. And by the end of the QSO, it's 61 degrees because the moon is, is moving, or the Earth is moving and the moon is moving. And that's what's represented here. You've seen this, this kind of an image before. This is a, an image, a time exposure of the sky. And you can see the stars are smeared in circles, rings, around the uh, Polaris, the North Polar Star. So what's happening is the moon is moving, not quite like this, it's moving differently. But the point is, it's moving through different positions. If it were rising, you could imagine for a given unit of time, the rotation is this much, but over here, it's this much. So the further up it is here, away from the polar position, the more rotation is going to occur during a roughly a six minute QSO. Um, the second station I got the same night was here, this uh, station in, in Slovenia. And you can see his polarization, my polarization, if it weren't affected by anything else, would have been minus 48 degrees <clears throat> and then it would have gone to 52 degrees so you can see the slope is different the starting point is different so this is starting to tell us that since we don't know who we're going to contact the geometric polarization rotation is going to randomize we don't know what we're going to what the other guy's going to see but it's actually more than that there's an ionospheric effect on vhf polarization as well as other uh, st st station frequencies and it gets worse at lower frequencies. So by the time you're at X-band, the polarization rotation is a lot less. And this is what I mean. Okay, well, here I'm transmitting a linear polarization. Let's reference show it here. And it passes through the ionosphere and it's gonna be rotated. That's because the ionosphere is birefringent. Birefringent means that there's an ordinary ray and an extraordinary ray passing through the ionosphere while it's in the ionosphere. That's the equivalent of circular polarization. And circular polarization is shown here. So that, that vector, that uh, electric field is rotating like this as it passes through. Now you might think, okay, well you go up, it rotates and it comes back and it rotates. It doesn't cancel out, it only adds additional rotation. So once again, we don't know what's gonna, what's gonna come back. We don't know who we're gonna be talking to and what he's going to see. Well, this is a, a, an easy calculation, a simplified calculation, put it that way. It's actually an integral path through the ionosphere. You have to take into account the magnetic field of the earth, the direction you're, you're going through the ionosphere, that's what's shown here, and the electron density and frequency. You can see frequency squared here. So the rotation is frequency dependent. <clears throat> For this simple approximation, and this is just to get an idea of what it is, it doesn't necessarily have to be this, but for this simple approximation at two meters, you can see that the polarization is, is rotated 14 and a half times. It's rotated 14 and a half times, okay? Or the equivalent of about three and a half waves of rotation. 
This is just like a, a birefringin crystal, like calcite. It splits the ray, it splits, splits the polarization into two rays, and then exiting its sum to a single polarization. All right, so turns out that um, Joe Taylor, the, the guy who's really started all of this and essentially created with his team JT65B, and he's a Nobel Prize winner, has done measurements to characterize the polarization rotation. Now, this is a monostatic measurement. It's round trip out and back from New Jersey, where he set up. And you can see the polar is, here's the position of the moon. And it was after sunset. And, you know, it's going like this. And he measured the polarization, and you can see how it's changing. So it's changing 220 degrees per hour. So if a QSO is roughly five minutes, that's roughly, um, what, five sixtieths, about, about, well, I guess about 10% of that, roughly, 22 degrees. So, but the key is that you don't know who you're gonna be talking to. So you don't know what the geometric rotation is. You don't know what the, what the uh, ionosphere is going to do. Uh, it changes, as you can see, it depends on whether it's day or night. It depends on whether there's a solar storm, whether the Earth's magnetic field is disrupted, all of these variables. So what does that lead to? The best way to look at it is that it's essentially, initially, you can treat it as a uniformly distributed random variable ranging from zero to 90 degrees. We don't know what it's gonna be. It's gonna be something. And it, the next time you operate, it may be totally bad for you. And that's why it's difficult to communicate unless you have a huge system and high power, a QRO system. But for the QRP system, we're really at the mercy of the ionosphere. And you'll see that in the next slide. Here I'm representing the randomness by this roulette wheel. It's interesting there, if you ignore the green sectors, there are 36, so every 10 degrees you get a sector and you launch, launch the, the ball in there, and at some point it stops, that's the equivalent of the initial uh, version of the polarization rotation. So initially it's random, but as we saw, it's going to slowly change. So that I think what that means, at least in my experience, is that you get groups of QSOs. There are times when nothing works, and then there are times when you get a group of QSOs because they're all from roughly the same area, say Europe, and the ionosphere, the path is roughly the same. And the, the, the uh, expected loss, the guess you would have for this kind of a distribution is minus three dB, which isn't too bad. So this half the time it's less than three dB, but the other half, it could be the cross pole response of your antenna, minus 20 dB, minus 30 dB, and that's not gonna work with a QRP station. So this is extremely important. And the QRO stations have, have taken measures to essentially reduce this to something that's not a problem, as you'll see. But I don't have that capability with the equipment I have right now. So now we're going to look at antennas. Which would be better for a QRP station, vertical or horizontal polarization? That's aside from what the ionosphere is gonna do. We're talking about the starting position. Okay, so I used Easy NEC, which is a, a, a very, I think, relatively famous um, antenna modeling program, fairly detailed. Um, you can put in different variables for, say, for example, the Earth conductivity. So I took the antenna that I have, a nine element Yagi, it's an M squared uh, nine element antenna, and I, put it one wavelength above the ground. This is a case where it doesn't make too much of a difference if you change the height of the antenna. So two meters is convenient. I can touch the antenna. I can move it by hand. This is what the gain is. <clears throat> so it, first of all, you should see that you can't put the energy on the ground. Why is it? Why does this occur? Okay, well, this is the equivalent of having a mirror image of the antenna. The ground is a, is a poor conductor, but it's in some sense, if you can imagine a mirror and you place a pencil on a mirror, you can see the image of the mirror in the, in the um, image of the pencil in the mirror. The pencil looks twice as large. So a, a one eighth wavelength vertically polarized antenna 
looks like a half wavelength. I'm sorry, one eighth length, no, one quarter wavelength looks like a half wavelength antenna. In this case, this is like having two Yagis separated by two wavelengths. And this is the result in antenna pattern, the, the true antenna pattern pointing out toward the sky. And there's a null here at zero. So you can't get the RF energy very well down on the ground. It's way down. You can see the, the log scale here. So that's vertical polarization. What about horizontal polarization? Well, you can see, first of all, uh, this is the same condition, one wavelength above the ground pointing parallel to the ground. It's now roughly 12 degrees, but the antenna gain is higher. So we're going to take advantage of this. We're going to choose horizontal polarization for our operation. We're going to choose to operate close to the ground because that antenna that I have is, is on the order of 3 dB lower than this, and I can use every dB of gain that I can get for the communication. So this is a geometric constraint now. I have to wait to when the moon is rising. There are other geometric constraints that you'll oh. see as I go on. Okay, so this summarizes it. Use horizontal polarization. And for elevations between 10 and 30 degrees, it beats the vertically polarized Yagi. And we also know, the, despite that, the, the ionosphere and the geometry is going to change the polarization that you receive. So I'm combining that, I'm using that as a loss, a polarization loss in the equation. Sure. So now I'll describe my station. And so here's where I'm located. And I mentioned geometric constraints. Okay, well, I'm in the middle of a suburban development and they don't like antennas. So whenever I did this, the first time I went out, it was dark. These people are all in their house. This is a January, it's a cold night. I'm in the garage here and I'm shooting between this house and these trees. And you'll see the geometry is in, in additional slides. I did the main beam hazard zone. It's about 80 feet or so. So that doesn't even reach this guy's property. And this is, by the way, if you're in the main beam. And we just saw that you can't put the main beam on the ground anyways. And the same thing is true for the side lobes. There it's maybe 20 feet, but there's nobody out. So this is essentially safe. This is what it looks like in the daytime. I used a camera that took an image of everything, so-called four pi steer radiant. It images everything in a sphere. You can see the top of my head here. You can see the house, the garage, the window that I've run the cable out. The antenna sits about here. The house that I'm talking about is here and the trees are here. So I'm trying to catch the moon right in here while it's rising. So that only occurs at certain points in time of the month. So you have to know what the position, position of the moon will be and what time if you have a limitation in azimuth and elevation. So what does that look like? Well, I got three QSOs on May 11th. And you can just barely see the moon. It should be right about here. And that's roughly a half a degree. And, and so my beam width is something like this, 38 degrees, three QSOs that day. And I should also say, so January was good. February got one QSO, barely. <clears throat> March, nothing. April, nothing. May, three. June, nothing. July, nothing. Six months. And there were three months where I got, I had success. So you need perseverance to get this to work. Okay, so there's a window. I told you how you have to, I calculated the azimuth and elevation of the moon. And that's shown here, azimuth and elevation. So this was the EME window based on the constraints of the geometry of when I'm transmitting between trees and the house. So, and this is January 19th. So I got two QSOs during this time. So elevation determined by ground gain requirements, get another 3 dB roughly. Azimuth, neighborhood constraints. I have to take the antenna down each time I'm done. I can't leave a 14 foot antenna sitting next to my house. And then I pointed, uh, in this case, with a compass and an inclinometer, as I said earlier. So this is what it looks like. Here's a normal picture. The garage is here. Ran the cable out up to this antenna and pointed it. Here's another view of the antenna. This is the antenna that I have M squared, 2M 
nine single sideband. Uh, that's basically the designation for this band. And they give you the dimensions and all the spacing for this particular antenna at 144.1 or 0.2 um, megahertz. I measured the VSWR of this antenna in situ, that is sitting outside, is the VSWR gonna be reasonable? You know, it's, near, it's only two meters off the ground and it's near my house. Okay, this is what I measured, point by point. And you can see it's very good around 144.1. It's, it's probably like 1.05 or something like that, which is very good. It's a very good antenna, very well behaved. I had a, a uh, well, I, I should have described it. I used an MFJ tripod and then I built a, a fixture out of PC, PVC pipe to hold the antenna. This is a block diagram, and the EMAers uh, in the audience would right away say, this is the wrong place to put the, the low noise amplifier. Well, the reason I put that there was because number one, this is Vox operated. It comes on when there's no RF power present at the input, which is here. In other words, or here actually, it measures the RF power whenever it's above a certain threshold, it switches it off, it turns the LNA off, it isolates it. So it doesn't, it's not destroyed by the transmitter. So it's got a hundred, I think roughly 100, 150 watt capability. I run it at 12 watts. There's no use redlining this. Green indicates RF power. There's some loss here and the amplifier boosts it up to roughly 200 watts and there's loss in the cable. So ideally if I wanted to operate with a better noise figure, I would move this guy up here, but I might risk losing this LNA. This LNA, as far as I know, still works. There is an issue with this ICOM 9100. It supplies 12 volts. That's the red. Red are DC voltages. 12 volts to this guy. And at some point it stopped, and that might be partially responsible for me not having more success with uh, EME. <clears throat> Okay, so how much did it cost? Whenever I did this, I was planning to put this together. I had to do some calculations to see if it would really work. And then I placed a bet, you had to buy stuff. I already had this transceiver. This is a good transceiver. It's no longer sold, but this was a, a bargain price uh, because it was going into obsolescence. But it works very well for satellites and EME at VHF and UHF, and probably HF for that matter too, if you're a 50 megahertz, I mean, 50 megahertz is VHF, sorry. Then power supplies and so on. Here's the Yagi antenna. These are 2018 prices. I'm sure it's more expensive. The one thing that's come down in price is uh, easy NEC. I paid $150, it's now free. I'd recommend you getting this. It's the it's the all out version, version seven. And it it has more elements that you can define an antenna than you'd want to. So that's what I'm using now. So it's important to note you can get this free, and I'd recommend it to all hands. It's fun to play around with, to see what your antenna can do and how you can change things. It generates antenna patterns, VSWRs, all of that. Okay, so a summary of the station is shown here. I'm in Connecticut. This is right on the border with Rhode Island near one of Bill's stations in uh, Jamestown, I think it is, Rhode Island coordinates and zones and so on, 177 watts. And now I'm gonna compare it on the basis of EIRP. So this is 177 watts is 22.48 dBW. As I said, 200 watts would be 23 dBW. So this antenna is rated at 14.2 dBi gain in, in a vacuum or out in outer space where there's nothing that can affect the antenna gain. The ground gain I said was approaching 3 dB, and this is for, at an angle of 15 degrees. So the total antenna gain is 16 and two thirds dBi. I is reference to isotropic. So you add these two numbers together and you get the power aperture product. This is what radar guys do. You, you basically characterize a radar by the power aperture product. So 39.14 dBiW. I used JT65B as you know, uh, you may know that others are using, what is it, Q65, which um, supposedly has better performance than this. 
And I mentioned the uh, safe distances from the antenna. All right, now we're gonna switch gears and talk about the signaling and performance of JT65B. A lot of people will say JT65B works to minus 25 dB. And so what does that mean? First of all, they're referring to a bandwidth that's 2,500 hertz wide. This signal, the signal bandwidth is not 2,500 hertz wide, but I'll stick with that convention. And it uses frequency shift keying. The next chart will graphically illustrate FSK. FSK is the transmission of information by different tones. The, the amount of information per tone depends on how many tones are in your alphabet. So JT65 has 64 tones. So two raised to the sixth power is equal to 64 levels. So you can transmit 64 bits with every tone. I'm not sure what they were doing in Close Encounters of the th Third Kind, but it's interesting to see they're showing essentially a spectrogram there with frequencies and time. So you can communicate data by encoding it in frequency space. You can also do time or polarization, but here it's frequency, FSK. 60, 65 S FSK or FSK 65, 65 separate tones. Why the fifth tone? I mean, the 65th tone, that's the, the, the synchronization tone. So 64 is a 64 airy, like binary is two, 64 airy is 64 symbols in the alphabet. All right, so that 65th tone is at 1270.5 Hertz from your carrier. So these are audio frequencies, and it's not unlike, to some extent, not unlike <clears throat> FT8. So what does it use? All right, so in transmitting, you generate this, and you'll, I'll show it in more detail. You have a forward error correction computation. It's a so-called low-rate Reed-Solomon code. Reed-Solomon codes were invented at the place I worked, MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And the notation is RS6312. 63 is the number of symbols that are transmitted. So we send 63 tones that are symbol, symbols of error correction symbols as well as information symbols. The information symbols are only 12. That's why it's a low rate. It's 19% of the bits that are transmitted or symbols that are transmitted are error correction bits so that you can correct mathematically you can correct a bit error and actually it's very good it can correct something like 20 some erasures in other words if you lost 20 20 symbols you can still correct and get a noise-free measurement or communications so those 12 message symbols are, include 72 message message bits and the uh 50 some, 53, I guess it is, or 51 uh, error symbols contain 306 error correction bits. A total of 378 bits, 63 symbols for transmission. So what happens next? Well, it's interleaved. If you think you send all of the um, information symbols, all 12 together, if there's a fade, it'll wipe everything out. It'll just wipe everything out you'll just have error correction code uh, symbols. So you interleave it, you scramble it by running it into a matrix, a seven by nine matrix into rows and you read out in columns. And you'll see that graphically, I've got that. So you'll see that. And then you alternate transmissions. You start your transmission one second after the UTC minute. So <clears throat> there are 128 transmission intervals, each of roughly a third of a second and transmitting one of 65 frequencies. So you're interleaving the sync pulses with the, the message pulse. The message has error correction symbols and message symbols. So the sync is just sync, and that synchronization is sent in what they call a pseudo-random uh, code, probably a linear, um, a linear code, a linear, um, I forget what, what the terminology is, but it's the equivalent of a key. If you place a key into a lock, you can see the different elements in the key fit into the tumblers. And when, when it's properly lined up, you can open the door. You turn the key 
and the lock is unlocked. Well, this is the same type of thing where you're sending a set of signals, in this case, essentially ones and zeros for the sync. And when that pattern of ones and zeros, which is pseudo random, lines up properly, then you're in sync in time and in frequency. So um, I mentioned that 40, roughly 47, 48 seconds of transmission, half the energy or half the power is in the sync and half the power is in the message. That's how important the synchronization is. They may have changed that in Q65, but this is what JT65B uses. So receiving, you have to de-interleave, that is unscramble it and decode the FEC code. Just a word about uh, forward error correction. It may sound mysterious to a lot of people. It's mathematical, highly mathematical. It turns out that if you're a ham and you use the uh, phonetic alphabet, the international phonetic alphabet to transmit. Say, for example, you're doing a satellite, you say Kilo Charlie One Hotel Tango Tango Foxtrot November 4 1. That's actually a code. And if you look at it, Foxtrot is two syllables. You're using that to represent a single syllable, F. But if you say F and S, you can confuse those symbols. So you use Foxtrot and Sierra. In a mathematical sense, that's they're orthogonal, they're very different. They're, they're less likely to be confused. So you're, you're using a forward error correction just by using the international phonetic alphabet to transmit your, your call sign and your location. So FEC does that, but it's with bits and it's with mathematical equations. And the mathematical analogy would be, if you know about algebra, if you have say three equations and three unknowns, you can solve for those three unknowns if you have three equations. Well, in this case, let's say we had 12 equations, but we have 50 measurements. So those 50 measurements could be applied in many different ways to solve those equations, but they're noisy. In other words, they're not exactly right. But if you take and, and run all of those, you can find out what the best fit is. And that's essentially what error correction does. It finds the best fit, almost like a curve fitting type of situation. But there's more. Okay, so there's a, the forward error correction. You have to decide, is it this or not? Okay, I mentioned the statistical approach is this soft decision. You take the best solution from the forward error correction. It presents you with these possibilities. You take the best solution. You gain 2 dB. Then finally, there's the so-called deep search decode, which requires a database of all operators. You have to put your call sign and station description into the call three text database for it to work well. So I have that. And the first time I, you know, in 2018, I didn't even know about it. JT65 was saying, you know, it was telling me call three text was missing. I didn't even know what it was, but Bill, who's listening today, told me what that was and how to get it. So I got that. That gives you another 4DB over soft decision only. So you can see all of these extra little elements, the ground gain, the soft decision, the forward error correction, and then the, the uh, deep search algorithm. All those add up to make your QRP EME work some of the time. So here's a, another way of looking at it. There are 28 bits here, 28 bits here, 15 bits, and there's an extra bit. So there's 72 information bits in this simple call. So that's 17 characters, 72 information bits. They encode it into 72 information bits that are unique. Then it goes into the encoder and you get 12, 12 symbols with this information and, and 63 total symbols or 51 error correction symbols. Then you run, into it, run it into an interleaver to scramble it. And that's shown in the next slide. So if these three are the information symbols, you run them into an array, and then you read it out this way. Run it in, in a row, read it out horizontally, and you can see how the message symbols are spread out. So this is done with a seven by nine matrix. And this is called one code word. We have one code word. We have to decode one code word for that message. It's not repeated, it's just sent once. And, and this, and you know, you saw the numbers here. So what are the tones that are used? These are the tones that are mathematically determined. 
and these are the symbols that they represent. I said six bits per tone. So if you looked at the tone here, 1335.02, that's 001011. Those are the bits that are transmitted by that tone, six bits per symbol. And there are 63 message symbols and a synchronization up here that's this frequency. That's the long message. What does that sound like? Well, I recorded what Bill's transmission was back in 2018. This is what it sounds like. The lowest tone is the synchronization. This is the synchronization down here, where you see these gaps and, and continued markers. The other part is the information. The other interesting thing that happened was, Bill was pointing out he illuminated an airplane <clears throat> that was moving at roughly 370 miles an hour. This is the radar return from that antenna, from that airplane to my antenna. You can see the Doppler shift is changing as the, the radio velocity changes. <clears throat> it's a little difficult to see the details, but here in another spectrogram, you can see things a little more clearly. You can see the steps in frequency. Each step is six bits. This is Bill's characteristic message, a CQ message that doesn't change because the code is fixed. Okay, other complications. The moon is in an elliptical orbit that changes roughly plus and minus five and a half percent. So sometimes it's closer, to, sometimes it's further away. You know, the super moon is when it's closer. Well, this is what the moon does during the course of a month. I think this was in October. I don't know what year it was, but it looks like it's wobbling a bit. Even if it wasn't wobbling and it was in a perfectly circular orbit, there would be a Doppler shift across the moon here. In other words, there'd be lower Doppler shift here and more at the limbs. And in fact, that's how a range Doppler radar works. You could image the moon at the right frequency. If you illuminate it, you could actually divide it up into Doppler cells and range cells. But what does it do for us? It smears the energy of our signal out of the bin that's supposed to be in. So it's reducing the signal. This is another loss. So this is important at the higher frequencies, X band, C band, L band, that's shown here. These are calculated by uh, Joe Taylor. And you can see the maximum limb to limb frequency is only four Hertz. That's not much at all. But at 10 gigahertz, it's 295 Hertz. So generally the fact that the Doppler shift is larger at these frequencies and the oscillators have to be more stable at these frequencies, it's a little bit more difficult to do this, you know, to get the energy in the correct bin. So you can identify it as say a six bit value. So these represent the 50%. Um, so it's mostly in, in the bin and the bins are roughly three, 3.8 Hertz. So it's not too bad, but Dr. Taylor has calculated what the, what the loss is. This is the performance of JT65B. When somebody says it works out to 25 dB, it certainly does. That would be the equivalent of saying noise-free communications. It's always going to work. If you're a QRO station, I think it would be hard not for it to work if your equipment is working properly. And that means you have a big antenna, and you have a lot of transmit power over a kilowatt. Maybe the antenna is an array of antennas. And then finally, you have a way for adapting to the polarization that you're receiving, an adaptive polarization receiver. And that's what they call M MAP65. So you have two receivers receiving orthogonal polarizations and the, the software combines it in a vectorial sense. If the polarization is here, you're getting values here and here and you combine it so you add these two together. The only loss is that you have two receivers and there's more noise in the receiver, but you really win big with regard to the signal that you've gained. You haven't thrown away the lost polarization. But you can also see it's a function of Doppler spread. This would be a pretty bad Doppler spread. So where does QRP operate? We operate down here. We operate, I like to say this, beyond the Shannon limit. The Shannon limit defines noiseless communication. He says in his theorem, and he's an MIT, was an MIT professor, that you need a certain amount of energy per bit to transmit noiseless, noise-free. In other words, no errors, no bit errors at all. And in practice, if you're a communication engineer, 
if you get one error in a billion, that's pretty good. That's You can say, my system is noise-free. But that's up here. And here it's shown as roughly 100%. Message gets through. But we're beyond that, which means that which means that um, we're operating beyond Shannon's limit here because we're talking about multiple dBs. And, and I'm going to see how far we are either away from uh, plus or minus from the Shannon limit at some point. I'll look at that calculation. So that's the long message. That's the one that's difficult. That's the CQ. That's the acknowledgement. But there are short messages that are generated, and they're shown here. This is the shorthand message. It's very simple. You send tones. You send the sync and you send the message tone, either R Romeo Oscar or Romeo 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 or 73. Looks like FT8. Okay, so the way it's decoded is you take the difference frequency between the sync and the RO, and that's 107 hertz. Okay, you get 107 hertz, you know that that's Romeo Oscar. All right, so how does this work? All right, these these tones. 16 sync tones and 16 uh, shorthand tones are transmitted during 47 and a half seconds. So they're transmitting and they're not, synchronization isn't important. You'll see decoding occur before the whole, the whole message has been transmitted because the signal to noise ratio is enough. And you can see it works out really well, even out to about minus 29, then it starts to fall off. But it works better than the long longhand message, the the, uh, the message we just talked about. So this is an easier one to do. It's transmitting 16 times. It's working to re it's repeating, and repeating is another way to ensure communications. This is what my first QSO looked like, and these are the this is the time that's associated with it. I got this out off of a screen save, and this is my CQ. This is the reply from Russia. Romeo X-ray 1 Alpha Sierra. And then here's my reply. OOO means that I've received you. That's the convention in uh, EME. You don't necessarily report, uh, say, 555 five, five or something like that. You say OOO. It's built in. This is what they use. This is what shows up on your QSL card, as you'll see. And you can see RO, RRR, and so on. And what it means, you all know what this means anyways. So now, how well did it work? How well did my QRP EME system work? All right, this is what the moon would have looked like if I could see it on that night. Uh, it was waxing gibbous, meaning that it's not, it's not a full moon, but it's approaching full moon. You don't want to operate when there's a new moon because that means the sun is behind it and your antenna will be looking at the sun. Okay, clouds are obscure the moon. I said I pointed with a compass and an inclinometer. But before I did that, I looked using MoonSked software. This is something you can get from this guy's website. I think he's no longer living. And uh, it plots what the sky temperature is. This is where the sun is. So if you're looking into the sun, the sun is a hot black body, meaning that it's radiating at all wavelengths. It's not just visible light. It's infrared. It's ultraviolet. X-ray. It goes all the ways down. And in fact, it even goes down to three Kelvin, although it's not significant there. The point is that the radio sky is a noise source. You have to avoid that. So you avoid that. Here's the Milky Way here. But there's a point where everything is really working well. In my case, on the 19th of January, and you know, since I had to go outside and set it up, no snow and everything, this is where I worked. And it wasn't actually optimum, but it wasn't too bad. It worked. So where was the moon? The Russian station is in St. Petersburg. The moon is over North Africa right here. And I'm over here in Connecticut. The sun is over here. The convention here in this case is the light area that's actually dark. And this is the, the place where the sun is. So this is the lit up portion of the earth. So it was at night and uh, in January. So I mentioned the radio sky. That particular software also calculates the moon position azimuth and elevation. I used that to do the plots you saw earlier. It shows where the moon is. You can see it's right here. The dark areas are the cold portions. That is, you're not looking at the Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, this circle is my beam width. So I encompassed a portion of probably 
part of the Milky Way because this sine wave is actually the Milky Way. This sine wave is the ecliptic plane. This is where the planets, the sun and the moon roughly travel. The planets are slightly off there and the moon can be slightly off, but it's roughly the ecliptic plane. So this is where, I, where the moon was with regard to the radio sky that particular night for both the first and second QSO. I mentioned this is where I was operating, shooting that way. The um, QSO I had in February, I was operating this way and he was at a high elevation and it just barely worked and he was probably the biggest station that I ever tried to contact. I didn't have the extra gain and perhaps my preamp wasn't working either. <laughs> so the calculation was here um, because I was pointing upwards. I should have been pointing horizontal for the initial thing. The gain was a little bit less than uh, it could have been. So that was something I learned after the fact. Here's what the display looks like. This is a screen save. This is the waterfall or um, frequency versus time. And time is evolving this way. Each of these larger segments is, is roughly a minute. And you transmit for about 48 seconds. The rest of the time is used for decoding the message. So these are sync pulses. They're readily seen. They're one frequency and half the energy is in there. The long message you can't see on this screen here. It just doesn't show up. On the other hand, you can see the RO tone and the 73 tone right here. These are the tones that he sent to me that I receive, indicating a successful QSO. This is the QSO. Um, you can see that if you look at the timing and everything, well, first of all, you should see the delta time here, 2.2 seconds. It was about 2.4 second round trip travel to travel time to the moon. It might have been an error of a tenth of a second in one or both of our clocks. Um, these other times here don't mean anything. Either there's no decode or it doesn't matter for the um, RO or 73. There's no synchronization. The signal to noise ratio that I saw is listed here, minus 19 dB. This is the best signal I ever received from any of the stations minus 19 dB in a 2500 hertz bandwidth. And this is again called out here, and you can see I mentioned this error here, and you can see lights up red just like FT8 if you're used to FT8. One of the things that Bill and Jim Spears um, taught me about was this bulletin board that's put together. Um, and you can see here that people exchange messages. They'll say they can schedule a Q, an EME. You can start transmitting QSO, I mean CQ to get a QSO, or you can set up a, a SCED. But the rules are that you can't use this while you're actually communicating. So what happened here was I was, is you can see this Russian ham saw my message and then he said, I, you know, I was, he was trying to receive me and he said he would call me. And then it proceeded from there through the QSO. Then afterwards, he said in a line here, and I've made it larger so you can see it. <clears throat> this is what he received from my, my radio, negative 24 dBSI. I think this 2.1 might be the time delay to the moon. I think this might be the, uh, probably it's either the temp sky temperature for him, which sort of makes sense maybe, or it could be the rotation angle of the polarization. And OOO means successful. And then I came back and said, this is my first, <laughs> first EME contact. So what did his station look like? <clears throat> his station, he's got a picture of this on QRZ.com. Romeo X-ray 1 Alpha Sierra. Uh, unfortunately, Sergey died this year. But he was in St. Petersburg, his location, the same format I used for mine. He has both vertical and horizontal polarization. I believe he's using adaptive polarization. That is, he's able to take into account the rotation of my transmitted signal and add both components that he receives in a vector sense to maximize the signal to noise ratio. I didn't have that, that capability, but because he had such a large antenna gain and high transmit power, his power aperture product was almost 53 dBW, dBIW. So 
as you saw, mine was 39. His is 53, roughly. He is QRO, I am QRP. And so later that night, not too much later, there was the uh, other station. Um, and actually, no, this is actually just the first QSO. This is the beginning azimuth and elevation and so on. The Doppler shifts of the moon. The moon is, is moving. And if you're working at a higher frequency, you have to take, that has to be taken into account. And JT65 can do that for you if you set it properly. Okay, this is the equation that I use. It's the radar equation. It's not your typical communications equation. This to me has more physical meaning. And in fact, you can write it so that it even has mo even more physical meaning because these gains are concepts that are wavelength dependent. The proper way to look at an antenna is there's an equivalent aperture area. It's most easily seen in a, in a dish antenna or a parabola. You can see the area. But a dipole, even though it's a single wire, a dipole has an area. Because it has 3 dB gain, it has the equivalent of an area that's related to lambda squared. So it's, it's measured in, in square meters. And you can convert that to gain. A dipole would have like about 3 dB, 3 BD, yeah, sorry, 3 dB I. All right, so you can see here the power aperture product. If, if I'm receiving it, I use all of these parameters, and here's the loss caused by polarization. This is an unknown. Here's the cross-section of the moon. Sorry, and then here's the loss due to the Doppler shift in the, in the uh, caused by the Doppler spread. So this is very small, but it's a wavelength-dependent thing. And, and I have to emphasize, if you're going to compare QRO and QRP by uh, power aperture product, it's a function of wavelength. Because the antennas at say 430 megahertz are are much smaller, and they still have higher gain, the effective aperture of that antenna is actually smaller than, say, if you had a um, a 10 wavelength antenna at at 70 centimeters, that would compare that to a 10 wavelength antenna at at two meters. The two meter antenna has a larger antenna aperture than the 433 or 430 megahertz antenna. So you have to be sure that you know what wavelength you're working at. You can see wavelength shows up here too. So converting it into a spreadsheet, that was the receive side, I mean, sorry, the transmit side you need to put in for the receiver. The yellow elements are numbers that you enter, you know, your transmit power, your noise figure, antenna gain, and here, I had to assume something for him. I wasn't absolutely sure that it was 1,000 watts. Could have been 2,000 watts. And noise figure, this is a reasonable number for him. Antenna gain, I looked at his antenna and estimated it. And then here's the signal-to-noise ratio that I would predict that he had at his receiver. And mine was minus 19, which is pretty good, which means that I didn't have much loss due to polarization. Here I was using the expected value which is about 3 dB of loss. So it might've been a little less than that. So now if I look at all of the QSOs that I've done, and there are only six of them, so I'm not like Bill or, or the guy from Montana with a lot of um, QSOs, but I've analyzed them and compared them, like looking at the measured receiver. So this is my receiver and this is my transmitter. How well does my transmitter get through? Well, it works really well. It's almost noiseless. That tells me I don't have to invest in a high power transmitter. That 200 watts is enough for a big station to get my signal. And part of that's because he's got a big antenna and he's and typically they have adaptive polarization. So they can take out the polarization thing. So it's relatively reliable in talking to them. Many times they heard me, I could not hear them. Some of the biggest stations I could not hear because of the ionosphere. On the other hand, I think I also had a problem with my lo local low noise amplifier. I don't think I it was being supplied with the 12 volts for, for some of these. And if I throw in that correction, then the numbers here are more reasonable. But you can see we're operating at very edge here of, of where it's gonna work, where it's not reliable. So you have to realize the QRP receiver isn't going to work very well all the time. 
unless you do something. And so that's representing going back to the performance of JT65. I showed you this earlier. This is where the QRP guys work. It's almost in the noise-free region. So Q, I mean, sorry, QRO stations. QRO to QRO station should be absolutely no problem. QRO to QRP, in my case, pretty good chance of hearing him. On the other hand, I mean, him hearing me. On the other hand, me hearing him, it can range from nothing to something really good. And that's the ionosphere, where it can range 10, 20 dB of loss. You can't control it unless you do things like maybe add another antenna. So these are the QSL cards I have. And I just wanted to point out that you can see that the receive signal is quotation O. That's what they use in the, in the QSL card to indicate successful QS, QSO. And there's Slovenia. And there's a picture of the antennas and the power aperture product. Emphasize again, these are big stations. And this is the biggest station of all, India 2 Foxtrot Alpha Kilo. He's in Italy. He's got a huge antenna array. And I could barely hear him because I was pointing upwards. I thought, well, I, I won't need to worry because he's got a big station. Well, I, I could have used those extra dB. I just barely made it. And by the way, you might think, is he transmitting circular polarization? Well, I don't know, but I do know that during this transmission, he switched polarizations, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. And I still had a problem. So it might be indica indicative of lack of ground gain and, and a higher noise figure in my receiver since the LNA may not have been working. And then on May 11th, I got three QSOs, things were working well. You can see the O here again. <clears throat> That's the Netherlands, Great Britain. By the way, all but this one were confirmed on Logbook of the World. This is confirmed via the QSL. And then this one was confirmed using an uh, EQSL card and on Logbook of the, of the World. So we're getting towards the summary now. <clears throat> so I've described some of the physics, the importance of the ionosphere in affecting your polarization and how it can limit whether it's gonna work or not. That's why you don't wanna give up. If you go out there and it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that, the, that an hour later it might work or two hours later it may work, or maybe the next day or the, you know, the day after that. The ionosphere changes. It changes slowly, but initially it's a random guess, a random variable. It's like that roulette wheel, it stops and then it's either going to work or it may work for a period of time, as seen here in the in the QSOs I got. <clears throat> so you have to know where the, the moon's position is. If you have a rotor, then you know you can track the moon and there are ways of doing that. But I pointed it by hand. You don't need a rotor if you have a large beam width. It's not like pointing a laser pointer like this. The beam width is so large, it's hard to miss the moon. Okay, so I've done the engineering analysis. I use the radar equation, which is different than what most people use to analyze performance. They use the communications uh, equations, which are essentially the same. The physics is the same. It's just that I think the radar, since the moon is, a, is an object that we're bouncing a signal off, it's more reasonable to call it a radar problem. So I modeled the performance and the cost and so on. These are the QSOs. So you can work large stations, but they have to be on the order of 50 dBiW. So 50 dBiW is a kilowatt with at least 20 dB of antenna gain. And that's, you know, that's probably a couple of, a couple of Yaggies or, or possibly four or more. And for a QRP station, it's best to operate at a low elevation angle. That should be obvious now. So what are the plans? Okay, well, increasing the antenna gain is much better for me to do than increasing the transmit power. The antenna gain works both on transmit and receive, and the antennas are less expensive than a kilowatt amplifier. All right, so one antenna would increase it by almost 3 dB. There's gonna be a combination combining loss, but you can potentially mitigate ionospheric Faraday rotation by using two orthogonally polarized, that is V and H, but not necessarily like this, but maybe like this. So you have some ground gain associated with each of these antennas, at least in one, one plane. 
So, and you could use a switch to go V and H. If you're listening and you don't hear anybody on V, switch to H. That may work. I haven't tried that yet. And then the ultimate is to develop an adaptive polarization receiver, like most of the big gun stations. This works extremely well. I believe there's at least one guy that's used an SDR play RSP duo. It's a dual receiver, software defined receiver, and it works at these bands. It works at least, I think, to at least three gigahertz or so, maybe two gigahertz. But you, it has two receivers. You have to make them coherent. They have to have the same local oscillator. So you have to lock it and you can inject a, a local oscillator into the, into the box. And then you can use the MAP65 software to combine them in a vector sense. So you have two receivers, two independent receivers, each with their own noise figure, contributing a signal plus noise in the final result. So it adds the signal coherently and it adds the noise incoherently and you gain a lot. <clears throat> and so that, <clears throat> that'll probably reduce the losses caused by the ionosphere and geometry to less than 3 dB. So we reached the end. Are there any questions? If you Let could, try. if you could uh, stop sharing you your... Uh, for those that want to know who's doing the talk, it's Rich Davidson, K9 RD. Um, two things that popped into my mind, one early, one late. One was Doppler shift. Um, are you referring to Doppler shift of the RF components or the tones that are being modulated into that RF with the RF? Okay. All right. So you transmit a signal and the signal might be at it's 144 megahertz. The Doppler shift I'm referring to is the Doppler shift of that. Since it's a carry, the carrier frequency for the other tones, the tone is actually on top of that 144 megahertz carrier. You're transmitting single tones. Each of those, the sum of the tone and the <clears throat> the carrier frequency are Doppler shifted by a hertz or two. Okay. At 144 megahertz, once you you down convert it, you down convert the Doppler shift. So if the Doppler shift were 100 hertz, you would down convert it out of the passband of your, or it would totally create a problem. Okay. But JT65 similar to what you do when you do with. Uh... AMSAT, uh, you have to deal with the Doppler shift because you're dealing with a moving target, a target that's distance is changing as you are communicating with it. And yes. The other question I had had to do with um, your statement that your reflected signal is going to be circular polarized because of the physics of the um, object and the passing through the ionosphere. If that's true, why did the adaptive polarization antenna make any difference? Okay, well, the adaptive polarization technique takes a vertical and horizontal component. And if you think about, well, let me, let's start with how do you create a circular polarized wave if you wanted to? You would take a set of elements like this and a set of elements like this. And if they were t lined up properly, you would delay one signal by a quarter wavelength, 90 degrees. Or you could displace the elements by a quarter wavelength to make a, a circularly polarized antenna. So that's a time delay. So the way an adaptive polarization receiver works, it, it, introduces, it introduces a time delay between the two receivers until the two signals add up together. Okay, just like so, you would use a hybrid for 90 degree phase shift. Well, yeah, hybrid, a hybrid can generate a 90 degree phase shift. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But in this case, it's digitally controlled. The software adjusts the phase. And if you play, I have a, an RSP duo, and I tried an experiment where I got a signal, split it up, put it into two cables of unequal length. And one of the cables had, if you remember, general radio, they had the slotted right lines. Right across the street from MIT. Yeah, right. They had the slotted lines. Well, you can still buy the stuff on eBay. I bought, a, a looks like a trombone line. You can change the length of the line. It's It's got an air dielectric. The mica supports for the center conductor and you can change it like a trombone. So you can put in an artificial delay. I was gonna use that to trim. If I was gonna do a uh, circularly polarized HF antenna, you can get a cable, but you gotta trim it. And I don't wanna cut and try, so I could trim it with this variable length that I had. So what I did was at home, I got a signal, split it into two, went through a fixed cable and then the trombone line, and I put the two signals into 
the RSP Duo receiver. And then I could adjust it and you can set it so that it compensates for the phase delay. Okay. You can see there's a display, a vector display that shows it rotating and it adds the signals up. So it does it automatically. So what I did was then I said, okay, let's put attenuation. Let's see where this thing falls apart. And so I got in one of these step attenuators, you put in 50 dB and another 50 dB. Sure. At some point you're radiating more from the connectors <laughs> than you are through the cable. So I could only get down, but it worked pretty far. I don't know if it would work at the levels that we're working at here. Interestingly enough, you've heard of obviously watts and milliwatts, microwatts, nanowatts, picowatts, femtowatts, attowatts. Well, the, the, where we are is zeptowatts. Oh, wow. We have hundreds of zeptowatts what? being received by this receiver. It's amazing. Zeptowatts. Yeah, 10 to the minus 21. Wow. So it's it's amazing because the bandwidth is so small. It can Bill, be done. Bill, could you stop sharing your screen and we'll get up? Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, it's not a problem. We'll be able to see the gallery better. Okay. okay yeah, there you go. Yeah, they were, we're all there. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, for Bill? And then uh, Mark Clockson, I think you were following the chat. Are there any uh, chat questions? And nothing's come in. Okay. Dave I, Dave, I had a question. Go ahead, whoever it was. Hi, Bill. This is Warren, KC9IL. Thank you so much. Hi. Wonderful presentation. I have a question. I'm trying to get my head around the fact that the big gun hears you, but you can't hear the big gun. No, I'm the I'm the um, QRP station. I am not a big gun by any means. Right. I don't have the money for that. But did you say that the big guns were hearing you and you weren't hearing them? Yes, that's what it looks like. There were examples when I could not hear the other guy, but he could hear me. And if you look at it, the calculation, it indicates that. And so you look at that performance curve for JT65B, they're working up in the almost the noise-free region. You know, where Shannon, like where a communication engineer wants to work. Ham radio guys work QRP, they're down in the noise. It doesn't always work. Right. But we all know reciprocity, but is there another variable that we're, that we're missing? Yes. The element that, that the big station has is he's got adaptive polarization. Okay. And maybe a better uh, preamp. Yeah, he might. Yeah, that, that could be. But I think the big killer is the polarization. Got so it. so that's, why, that's my conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a yes. question. I have a question. K nine Y O. Has anybody ever tried rotating the antenna to align it to the proper polarization? Well, I think that's what uh, India Two uh, Foxtrot Alpha Kilo is doing. He could switch his transmit polarization V or H. The other thing yeah, they could uh, potentially, yeah, Bill. Uh, th th this is Bill. Uh, yeah, I just last year bought. I've always used antennas like Bill has the same exact M two antenna. I have two of them instead of one although i started with one but last year i bought a cross polar two cross polarized antennas where each each boom has a set of vertical elements and a set of horizontal elements and then you have a switch so you can either receive horizontally or vertically and sometimes i'm receiving horizontally i hear nothing you switch to vertical and it's loud and clear so to speak because the, the faraday field will will um uh, uh, in, invert the signal, sometimes you, you have to switch between receive and transmit. That is, they may be hearing me horizontally in Europe, but which there's a, a, a spotting site. You can tell how they're receiving you over there, but, but uh, I'm, I'm receiving them uh, vertically because so you have to transmit on one polarity and switch to the other to receive to have an easy uh, QSO. Okay, yeah, that's kind of my point. Okay, if I had just one antenna that I had up set it set up horizontally polarized pol pol polarized for transmission, when I went to receive, could I uh, rotate that antenna vertically or at some angle and uh, tune to uh, the proper polarization? There's a guy in Japan who has a setup like that. You know, you can I don't remember his call sign, but he actually rotates. He can rotate his entire antenna. But that's pretty kludgy. That's mechanical. You can mm -hmm. do that electrically. If you have samples of V and H, you can have any polarization you want. Yeah, with two antennas and more equipment than yeah. Okay. Well, no, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer. 
<laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, I was expecting a lot of websites as resources. Um, what are some of the key websites? Okay. I have a paper that I wrote back in, in April 2019. In fact, Bill was at that talk too. And it was early on and I hadn't thought as much about this, but I wrote a paper and, you know, that's interesting. <laughs> I wrote a paper and the paper has a lot of references in it. So you can, you can track down all the websites. You can get the papers that I use, like to get the radar cross section, all of that. I can send that paper to you, to your club, and then you can distribute it. I can I also agree. send these charts if you want. Okay, that'd be perfect. Yeah, send it to me, and I'll uh, I'll make sure it's uh, distributed. Thank okay, you, Dave. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Alpha Char Alpha Charlie Nine Lima Mike. Okay, um, you made a subtle nuance, and that is getting a second antenna and mounting it horizontally alongside your other horizontal antenna versus setting that up as a cross polarized antenna and using adaptive polarization. Um, is that in order to get the more transmit gain to get to the other side, or do you actually gain more receive gain because you're using the horizon with the two horizontals than using the cross polarized? Right. That would be the first step is to use two horizontals because you would get you. That would be the maximum gain situation for a single polarization. Yeah. And that would help. It would help, obviously, both ways. But it's not the same as, as Bill said, switching from one to the other. If you have two present and it might be better to <clears throat> put them at 45 degree angles instead of, you know, strictly vertical and horizontal to your location. Understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, These are the are things that have to be tried. Yeah, exactly. Now, are the big guns, are they, when they transmit, they don't transmit on both horizontal and vertical. They switch back and forth. Well, I don't know for sure, but I don't think, I think the convention for the microwave guys, you know, uh, any, anything above a gigahertz, I think you do, you use right-hand circular polarization. Is that true, Bill? Yeah, I, I'm pretty active on, on 1296, which is 23 centimeters. And uh, I think I started with a single Yagi, 67 elements, but that's easy. They're little teeny elements. And then I went to two Yagis. And finally, I got a 1.8 meter dish, which opened a new world of stations to work. And now I have a three meter dish. And like that's the entry level three meter dish to be able to basically work everybody. As Bill says, you get big enough, you, you can you can work everybody. But, but it is, uh, you, you get a feed for the dish that is designed either uh, by its nature or with a hybrid thing that switches it. So you, you, you transmit in one polarity and receive in the other. But uh, I'd say on uh, 1296, the dish is the only way to go. I learned that incrementally, but I'd recommend a small dish to anybody starting up there. But that would be too big a dish on two meters. You have to use Jaggies. And they sell the antennas uh, either in an X, X uh, cross polarization uh, on the boom, they're uh, 45 degree, two 45 degree angles opposite, or one vertical, one horizontal. I chose for the horizontal and vertical so I could use the antenna on horizontal for terrestrial work. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, you know, transmitting circular, say right hand out to the moon, the moon switches it to left hand. So do you switch your receiver to receive that left hand signal, left hand circular polarized signal? Gentlemen, we're up on uh, nine o'clock. I'd like to take a moment and allow our club president, uh, if he wishes, to uh, provide us with any closing remarks. And if uh, there's interest, I'll keep the uh, meeting going for a little while to uh, allow for questions. So, Bert. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I can't believe uh, the amount of attendance we had tonight and, and how many people stuck with us. It's just a reflection of the quality of the presentation. We thank you very much for your efforts and uh, keeping us all informed on something that's uh, pretty new to most of most of our membership, I think. And with that, I'll go back to you, Dave. All right. Thank you, Bert. And we'll take Dave? a few more questions if uh, if you like. Yeah, Dave, it looked like uh, Bill uh, W3CJK uh, may have had a question or something, but his uh, microphone was muted. Hopefully he unmuted now. 
All right. Yeah, yeah I have one thing that uh, Bill has done a wonderful presentation from the engineer's standpoint. I'm not an engineer. I was a lawyer, although I was a signal intelligence officer in the Air Force, and I did a lot of a lot of stuff and I've been a ham since 1955. So from the ham's perspective, as opposed to Bill's, you can get on EME if you have a terrestrial uh, two meter rig with a multimode transmitter, you, you need a hundred watts, two or three or 400 better uh, and a single Yagi. And if you have perseverance, you can work a lot of people without knowing any of this stuff. It, it's the, uh, uh, it's the ham art side of it that you have to really get into uh, how to do this with your uh, hand on the receiver and uh, so forth. It's it's easy once you get the hang of it. The learning curve is big. All right. Any other questions? I have a question, NJ Nine R. Um, how much of the secret is in the settings of the WSJT or WSJTX or the map. Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of uh, documents out there. However, not too many of them are specific on how to set these up. Seems like um, folks that have been around for a while, they're, they use WSJT more than WSJTX um, because supposedly it has a better decoder. Um, versus the, the newer one. I know Lance wants to use Q65 on his upcoming expedition, and I apologize for that email. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, they're, I guess they're visual modes. The JTs are visual modes where you can actually see a trace, a sync, whereas the, the, the Q65, you don't see the trace anymore. Uh, so, so how much of the secret is in the software and how to set it up properly, whoever wants to address it? Well, I'll, I'll speak because I use Q65. I think it's by far the better. I've, I've decoded signals and work people at minus 35 dB, uh, lots of minus 34, it's not minus 32. It just pulls the weaker signals out. But if you think about it, if, if, if you took Bill's station as he did it in 2019 and gave him uh, JT65, that would be like giving him two more antennas. Uh, it would, uh, or, or, maybe quadrupling his power. It's so, so much more sensitive that it, it is, it's opened a whole new world, but there's a lot of resistance on two meters. Everybody's sticking with JT65 because, because of the uh, shorthand mode, they like that, but it, it, because they see it and play with it. And it's Q65 is more, you have to be precise. I go down to where I'm list the computer. I direct it with the, with the F toll function in there to look at five cycles of, I say computer, focus on this five cycles of the bandwidth, that's where the signal's gonna be. But you gotta know how to figure out where it's gonna be to that uh, uh, closeness. And to that, it seems like sometimes the guys are saying I'm calling on this frequency, but they're not always saying what the, what the actual audio frequency is like. You should say if I'm calling on, on 114, I'm calling at 1,000 hertz. That way I know where to focus on you. And, and I know bigger guns don't care because you're supposed to be able to see them. But uh, little guys that can't see anything on the screen, it would be advantageous that, that we know. Uh, yeah, you you got to know the time. You got to know the time. You can't find them. You're right. Any other questions? Well, Bill, thank you very, very much for taking the time to do this. This is one of the most sophisticated presentations we've probably ever had. And I think, don't think we've ever had this many people in a, uh, in a meeting, certainly online. So uh, we really do appreciate the work. And I think Bill has indicated he's going to give me a, uh, a copy of the presentation that uh, uh, I can distribute later on and some other materials. So again, uh, we really do appreciate your taking the time. I've learned a lot uh, and I'm sure other people have as well. So with that, I think I'll say good night all and we'll close up the Thank proceedings. Thanks everyone for attending. Stay safe out there. Nice job, Thank Bill. You. Thank Bye. you. Fabulous.
check one. 